gospel reading from today will be from Mark chapter 11, verses 1 to 11. When they were approaching, approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the, Lord's, the Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door, outside in the street. As they are untying it, some of, the, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out with Bethany with the twelve. The word of God for the people of the God. Thanks be to God. Did you know that some churches are already reading the passion of Jesus? Some churches are already into the Holy Thursday and the Good Friday story preparing for Easter. Some churches don't focus upon this procession into the big city. Some churches ride the donkey all the way to the Last Supper and to the crucifixion. No Thursday night service, no Good Friday service, no shouts of loud Hosanna today as a place where we stop and pause, no Thursday night supper, no memorializing Jesus on Good Friday. I worry about that. Because truth be told, our journey of faith is not a uh, quick overnight uh, fix. It's a long and winding road, right? It's not all rainbows and butterflies. It's not all uh, Robert, cookies and milk. Wasn't that what your pastor said to you one time? But it's not all whips and chains and bloody suffering either. The journey we take is full and rich with experience, happy and sad, scary and celebratory but all sacred and filled with God's glory in God's time. Jesus invited the followers to follow the way. And I say that means all the way to Jerusalem, into the big city to have supper at the table, all the way into the table to see where the robbers were hiding, all the way through their abandonment of Jesus on the cross. And sometimes I wonder if we realize just how alone he was. Sometimes I wonder or even wonder if we think about how Jesus on that donkey road on his own into the city with people shouting, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, who's going to restore our temple and our tribes and our fellowship. And he knew that he had something else in mind. I wonder if he knew that people were going to be disappointed and that not everyone was going to believe because they didn't like the way things were playing out, and sometimes neither do we. I wonder if we ever think about just how well alone he was, and I know some of us are thinking, yes, but he's Jesus. So I'm talking about the fully human part of him. 
I wonder if we spend much time thinking about what it was like to call those to follow and have them wander and listen and not really get it and then have him be abandoned by those same friends. I suppose it depends on how you read the text. But maybe he was abandoned by God. And I bet that some of us are feeling alone or abandoned this morning. I bet some of us are feeling that God is distant and that the hopes and the dreams and the longings of our hearts have not been fulfilled. And we're wondering when we can rise. So here's a bit of good news. This week is for you. This week of journeying with Jesus through it all is a week where you, where we can walk intimately with him and realize all that he had to go through to get on the other side. All that he had to go through to get to a place where together we could rise from our couches of desperation, our beds of depression, our computer screens, and the fear and the isolation we feel. We, too, can rise. I wonder if we think about the vulnerability of Jesus that day, riding down the mountain, riding down the Mount of Olives. And I wonder if we know that there were actually two processions that day that entered Jerusalem. From the east side of the city, Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee, riding a stinky mule down the Mount of Olives, a story we know quite well. And from the west side of the city came the procession of Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. He led his cavalry and his soldiers. He was armed and dangerous. You know, we talk a lot about how Jewish is our story. There are three quotes from the Hebrew Bible in our Palm Sunday narrative alone, but we don't talk a lot about how immersed in the Roman Empire we were. You see, it was standard practice for the Roman governor to be in Jerusalem for the festivals, to reinforce their power in case there was trouble. At the head of the Roman government, government was the emperor who was also known as the Son of God, Lord and Savior, the one who had brought the Pax Romana, peace on earth. After his death, he was seen ascending into heaven to take the, his place among the gods. And yet it sounded familiar. Christianity was immersed in the language of the empire, in the culture of the empire. But Pilate's procession that day reminded the people who was in charge. The power of the empire. That puts Jesus' procession in context, doesn't it? I am way ahead of myself here. I don't know what happened. But that puts... Jesus' procession in context. This morning at 8.30, there were uh, two little boys sitting over here. We don't always have a lot of kids at 8.30. And I looked over at them and I said, I wonder sometimes if Jesus wasn't wishing for a big truck, a Hummer, or a Land Rover. And the little boy said, yes, absolutely, <laughs> he was. in his hands, their lives, their future, their temple, in his hands. And yet he followed what the prophetic words would say and rode that donkey. After King David's death, his son Solomon became king and Jerusalem became the home, right? The home of the monarchy and the upper class. And then, under many empires, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Jerusalem became the center of a social system that was rapidly 
rather oppressive. The gap grew between the rich and the poor. All of this oppression and domination done in God's name. That's the system that the prophets of the Hebrew Bible were speaking to. Sometimes I worry about the way the Hebrew Bible is laid out because you read all the history and then you read what the prophets had to say about it. Well, it would be helpful to know that not unlike the march yesterday that happened in a time, in a place, in context, there were voices crying out against the empires and the powers that be and the temple that was kind of liking the power and the money. We need to hear the voices of the prophets that are speaking out against the empire, the systems and the structures that are still in place where people are suffering. And Jesus knew that that's why Jesus came. That's part of the symbolism of the mule. He knew that he wasn't going to fulfill all their dreams to take over and reestablish Judaism, per se. And yet, he had the courage, the divinity, let's say, within him to be vulnerable. And so should we. Because if we are feeling alone, or we are feeling isolated, or we are feeling somehow not a part of, we can ask for help. We can pray the prayer that gets prayed in the garden. We can pray the prayers that we can be one. And so it is that when Jesus went into the temple, and overturned the tables. He's overturning that system, that oppressive system that scholars call the system of domination, where the playing field is not level at all. And that's what Jesus came to set people free to live on an equal and level playing field, to avoid the systems and structures that were hurting people and causing them to suffer, even still. That's what we're called to rise up to overturn. But we're called not to do it alone. We will rise up next week to fear not in situations where the prophets need to rise, to rise up to speak out when our own communities need help. Because we are a community of friends, and we are not going to abandon him this whole week. We are going to journey through the services and live through the Last Supper and sit and wait and memorialize him and not know what's coming until Sunday morning when we are all called to rise up. <coughs> Most importantly, we're not going to do it alone. And more and more as I read through these stories and I really think about what it was like, to live or be with Jesus, to live or be Jesus himself, I become, it becomes more clear to me why he prayed those prayers in the garden, why he prayed that we would be one and that, that our love for each other would be paramount. He wrote that donkey and face the week all by himself. And he does not want us to do it alone. That is the gift of the church, where the hope and the promise of Easter is always before us, and we are not alone. There is no question in my mind that there are still two processions, an empire, with structures and systems that need to get fixed. And the kingdom of God, which is often a long and lonely, winding way. But it is one of peace and a leveling of the playing field for all people to know God's love and grace and mercy, to flourish and to thrive. And so I do. My prayer is that you will be here this week. I have heard from people that Good Friday is simply too sad to come to church. Well, yeah, it's a little sad. But that 
that sadness makes the rising up and celebration of Easter, the hope and the promise of life in the face of the death and the violence and the suffering, all the more powerful. I've heard that Holy Thursday is unnecessary. We celebrate communion on a regular basis and do not need to do it on during Holy Week. Well, yes. do it alone. 